Today I'm really honoured to present to you Tim James from Teesside University. So those of you who gave fantastic feedback comments from Tim's previous presentation with us, we're really delighted to have um, Tim back. He's going to present to us the use of I2 in his teaching practice and we all know how amazing Tim's resources are. I learned so much last time. So as I said, we're delighted to introduce Tim. OK, everyone, thank you very much. Hopefully you can see my, my screen there. Today I'm looking a little bit into putting the intelligence and investigation into CSI. That's an important aspect that we don't lose sight of when we're covering that sort of material. You've got to very much see now the CSI is part of the investigative team. I think that's part of the reason why they actually changed the title from crime scene examiner, etc., to show that they are part of that investigative unit within the police itself. And there aren't that many CSIs within a police force operational area, so they see a high um, proportion of the significant crime in their divisional area or however they're, they're spaced out through a police force. Myself, um, when I was in Durham, between myself and my colleague, we saw about 50% of the significant crime in the Durham, Chester Street divisional area. So there was a lot that you know came our way. And we had that knowledge immediately accessible to us. And it wasn't just knowledge of the scenes, you know, we start to realise we've got intelligence, we know what's happening, we know where it's happening and that sort of thing. And then it became important for us to be included by the, the wider uniform policing um, community and the other um, police uh, support staff and the intelligence and be brought in and be able to input our information into the intelligence cycle and to the briefings as well. So we're going to the scenes and we are sort of in a, in a sense building up our understanding of the 5WH model in our own sort of way. The MO, how the crimes are committed, how do they get in, what do they use, tools, points of access, um, et cetera, what types of, of property, why the crimes were committed, looking at a broader context, what type of goods are they after, jewellery, money, large items, etc. So it was extrapolating a little bit, but it's sort of part of that thought process. Temporal aspects, we obviously don't appear at the time of the, the incident. You speak to the aggrieved party, you read the incident logs to get an idea of what you're going to face, and you can start seeing you know, when they came in, when they were reported, you know, if you do attend quite shortly after, if you're on a back shift, you know, it occurred, you know, a couple of hours before, et cetera, with that. And you keep going back to the same sort of area for a similar type of crime. You think, oh, I was around the corner the other day doing another burglary like this. And you start to build up that spatial awareness as you're doing your job as well. And again, we don't get a name, but the forensic evidence, we get an understanding of potentially we're gathering material as to give it that could give us a name. Who did commit these crimes? What DNA have we found? What footwear have we found? What fingerprints have we found? You know, with the DNA and fingerprints, we can't match those visually, but with the footwear, we should be looking at the footwear itself and saying, have I seen this pattern somewhere before? I did, I saw it, you know, two weeks ago at another burglary dwelling, similar MO, similar type of um, items taken, you know, tool used, etc. So the whole time it's important that as part of that investigative team, you're having that sort of broad holistic mindset. So you're not there just at an individual single scene, treating it by itself, bagging and tagging. You've got to keep your mind open. So you're having that holistic view of the crime and the crime types in your operational area. You need to actively note scene to scene links, you know, be consciously aware of them. What was the MO? What footwear has been there? Where are they? You know, burglary dwellings, assaults, types of theft, etc. and the times. And that very consciously needs to be at the fore of your mind and in discussions with your colleagues um, in the office. And again, you can bring that to the intelligence team as well. You need to be proactive about that. You know, depending on your team, we have some very good detectives who would come into our office and say, what have you found? What footwear have you found? You know, what was the um, MO of this? You know, oh, I locked someone up a few years who did things similar to that, who lives in that area and became part of that overall investigative unit, which I think is really important. And sometimes I get the feeling that the intelligence value and knowledge that the CSIs have you know, at the top of their mind is often overlooked. Yes, your crime scene report forms are available electronically, et cetera, and the intelligence officers can go through them. 
but often conversationally more information will be imparted a lot more quickly and a lot more efficiently so being a part of those conversations i think is important in relation to um, educating our students we want them to be CSIs of tomorrow but there's more and uh, much more varied roles out there than just sort of crime scene and forensic um, and police jobs the subdivisions of those so we need to recognize that much of the additional academic content they receive in the degree program may not be part of a specific operational role but it does broaden the career exits you can have as you move out so it recognises that through this content can help them undertake the operational role to a higher and more professional standard and contribute to the investigative process. So even though it's not innately part of it, if you can actually incorporate it into your professionalism within those various roles, you can do those jobs to a higher standard and be more productive um, for the police force or whoever your employer is, even if you're in private industry doing intelligence work or whatever, that's important as well. And it does start to make the students realise, even if they're on a, a more specific degree programme, there are broader career opportunities out there and they can start thinking about those and realise what skill set they do have, what they've acquired and start to have the confidence to apply for those other graduate jobs that are out there. So we're going to use various tools to develop intelligence and support an investigation. And rather than just thinking of a crime scene, educationally, we contextualise that often into a, a proper crime scenario and into linked series. And it's up to the student then to start to see and build up those associations. And it's important to actually be able to visualise things. We get them to do briefings. And if you've got a, a graphical representation of the area, it's much easier for the audience to understand. And quite often, if you've got a large inquiry, you bring in police officers from outside the area or the immediate area, and they may not know the relationship of one place to another. So actually being able to see it and understand it. Also, if they're going out looking for the places, having pictures there will really support them in actually undertaking their job and getting a mental map of what's going on. Collate the information from the practicals they attend. So when we've got a normal year, the students will go to a number of the, the scenes physically, they'll collect their own evidence and then we supplement that as required with paper feed, most often with um, exhibits from post-mortems, from um, examinations of um, victims, etc. So they won't collect that information themselves, we'll give them the exhibits from that, the crime scene report forms, etc. to go with that. But hopefully in the academic sense and the educational sense, they've been to some of these scenes themselves. And so they can see what was going on. They've got their own mental picture. But it's also important to think they wouldn't go to every scene that they're a part of a, a team collating the forensic submission and actually looking at the inquiry. So they have to be able to understand scenes they didn't physically attend themselves. The information comes in over a number of weeks, I'm expecting them to transfer that information into an Excel spreadsheet. There's a lot of data recorded now by police forces in various forms. So that's going to come in and they're building up themselves. And it's actually showing them that the spreadsheet, yeah, it's got information, but you're going to do more than that, you know, more to it than just see it in the spreadsheet. And the videos will hopefully demonstrate that. They're going to import that information directly into Google Maps or IBM Analyst Notebook, the I2 system, showing that if the force goes to the trouble of collating information into spreadsheets, you can use that in multiple different ways to really help drive an investigation forward. And using these tools, you look to underpin them by various other aspects of academic research, research and theories. So we're thinking of um, intelligence, we're thinking of um, how we can go about that, various models. So we want to turn the information in those spreadsheets from data to information to intelligence and then up to definitively, hopefully, knowing something in relation to that. You can bring in crime theories and approaches, rational choice theory, routing activity, problem analysis triangle, offender location victim, and that comes out strongly in the spatial analysis. They undertake a SARA, was to gather the information to collate into their spreadsheets, traditional 5W8H uh, H model, and if we've got chisers coming in, we can add additional intelligence that they can consider in relation to that. So what we have in, in the, the main piece that we're looking at today in the videos, the context is a drug facilitated sexual assault, a series of linked crimes, <clears throat> but the different crime types. So, Sexual assault and leading to a murder in the end might be the most serious, 
But prior to those and underpinning those are theft of motor vehicles. They're stealing a motor vehicle to help them facilitate the actual assault. You have the assault and the pickup of the individuals. Where's that? How's it gone about? Then the vehicle gets abandoned in another location. Firearms come into it. So we get an escalation of the seriousness of these um, incidents. So I've got two videos here, one showing how to import it to, <coughs> excuse me, into Google Maps. Um, after that, I've got one looking at the um, IBM Analyst Notebook I2. So the first one's about 10 minutes, the second one um, about 16. Um, depending how the hosts want to run it, we can have a pause after the Google Maps one if people want to have a discussion and then go on to the notebook or have the discussion there at the end. So hopefully someone will take over and they'll present to you and play from their end the Google Maps. So here's where we're starting to look at the information the students are collating over a number of weeks. You can see from these different colours, these are different scenes which the students either have uh, attended or have received information on. And they need to take that data um, from the incident logs, crime scene report forms, etc., and start inputting that into an Excel spreadsheet. As they're doing that, what's important is um, the titles they give to the columns up here because these titles are going to be used as the various names and help with the importing of the data. Here, I've got a single grouping incident <coughs> and an incident grouping. This is for me to help me import into um, I2 later on. We've got crime reference, date, time, location, incident, type of offence, latitude and longitude. Again, that will become important in a moment and the address. So it's important that they have those titles, they gather the information and they want to be turning the um, data to information, to intelligence, to knowledge. We're going to do that in a spatial um, manner. If we then think about how we can get this into um, our Google um, Maps, so you can quite easily get an account, go to your places, maps and then create a new map. So we're going to look to import that information and think of various ways of um, doing that. <coughs> so I'll give it a title. And then we're going to import into our layer here. And it gives us the option there of just dragging and dropping our file. So that drops in there. Here you can see the um, column headings Google recognizes and it already automatically recognizes latitude and longitude. You can tell it if you've given it a different name, but that's where it's handy to have it right from the beginning. And then we're going to title our um, locations. So we can do it by location or incident or whatever we want. So we're going to do it by incident this time see it importing and loading up here and then automatically it populates the map with all of those um, instances within our spreadsheet so if we go back to our our spreadsheet now each one of these um, rows has been populated straight away into our google maps all the same color all sort of um, just simple pins at the moment but these can be changed and improved but as we're looking at this, you can see the information here is what we had in our spreadsheet. So that's been imported straight away. It's not had to be typed in again. Hopefully it's going to be accurate. So it shows that information transferred straight away into there. So that's straight in there. But if you saw from my initial um, spreadsheet, I've got these um, color coded because they're sort of, you know, each group is a set of what we think is a linked um, set of offences um, for a particular occurrence, and then there's similarity um, between those. So we can improve the way we, we generate um, our map. So rather than just having it all import together, what we can do then is do it layer by layer.
So it's important here then with the um, spreadsheet, you can see we've got the tabs across the bottom. Google Maps looks for the first tab. So if you want to take this information, I've split it up into AA, BB, CC across the bottom here. So I'm just gonna drag this AA tab to the front. And then now when we go back to Google Maps, we're gonna import we're importing our um, same file. And again, it's picked up those. We'll do it by location. And if I take off the initial ones, you can see now this one has just imported those four sets of information. So theft of motor vehicle, 24 Warwick Street. If we go back to our spreadsheet, our theft of motor vehicle here at 24 Warwick Street. So those four have gone in there. So they're collected into a single layer itself. So what that enables you um, to do is to build up a map like this. This is a number of layers. You can see those layers down the side here. And having those layers also helpful in um, briefings as well, because what you can do then if you want to do is start unticking those layers and you'll see the information start to drop away. So you can be left with less and less in relation to that. And then if you want to add it back in, you just click on there. So it's really useful, simple way of uncluttering um, your map if you're doing a briefing in relation to what's gone on. Got our 24 Warwick Street there. What we can see is we've got an image on there. We've got some information in relation to that. And it's handy that if you don't know the area, people can put in little bits of information. And you can see we've also changed the pins to actually icons which are more representative of actually what's gone on. Routes have gone in either as um, lines, which we've called a route, or you can actually put in directions if you want to. You are limited to the number of layers you can have on here, but it does give you a fair amount um, of freedom with that. So we've got our um, 24 Warwick Street there. If you want to put um, an image in, we can look to um, to do that. The easiest way is just put the address in in the search. You get given some images here, drop into Street View. And then we've got our, our premises there. Then we're just going to use the SNP tool that comes with Windows. Grab the image there. That saved, back to our map, add an image. Make sure we save it and you could add multiple images if you wish. Um, so it doesn't just have to be the single one. You can change your color as we've said before. And you can change um, the style of your icons in relation to that. So vehicle. So you can help them stand out. So now when we come um, to this icon, we click on it, we have a picture and then we have the associated intelligence and information that comes with it. Hopefully, as we sort of look at this map, we have moved from um, data to information to intelligence we can see some of the main aspects which are, are happening in here here we've got an area where our vehicles are taken from here's an area up here in this lighter blue where the vehicles are um, abandoned we've got an area here where the people are are taken if we start thinking of um 
knows around a person with which a person might be operating and um, work home social we might be able to be thinking you know where these vehicles are taken from is that on the way home on the way to work on the way from work where they're abandoned then is that more likely to be near where they live etc um, in the end of this investigation this turned out to be um, a place where they were um, working on the way home to where they lived up here was this route and therefore they would pick up the vehicles here commit the crimes and then abandon the vehicles up in this area which is near where they lived so that's an important aspect there that enables you to go through some of the um, crime theories and bringing a lot of other theoretical policing intelligence work and allows the students to build up and collate um, a spatial analysis of that. This is obviously a very small area. You can do cross-border crime, international crime, and just expand um, the links in relation to that and plot out additional information as well. That was really, really interesting. Thanks, Tim. And um, we think we'll, we'll do some um, questions uh, first of all. Uh, Ian, have you got some uh, either from the, the Q&A or some that you'd already thought of yourself? Yeah. Hi, Tim. So I know you haven't finished yet, but we're all um, very, excited, very excited about what we've seen. So we thought we'd just take the opportunity to ask a couple of questions after that video. Uh, I'm going to ask the obvious technology one. That video looked very seamless, very easy to do. Um, what kind of prep work did it take to get the skill set necessarily to develop that um, tool? It wasn't too bad. Obviously, I didn't have the confidence to do it live, but that was just done in one go, so it, it wasn't too bad. It, it doesn't take long at all. Um, if someone shows you how to do it, you can pick it up really um, quite quickly. And then you see differences between the students as to how creative they become. And do they do the little things like change the, the, the pins to proper icons? Do they color code it? Do they have the color coding matching throughout other pieces of work and um, they generate? But using it and doing those simple layers and importing, it, it doesn't take long. It, 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 I, I do it with the first years in um, a blended um, seminar lecture over about two, maximum three hours. And then that gives them enough to get them going and play with it in their own time plus the videos i've got online they can just go and watch me demo it again but it's it's not too challenging thank you tim uh, we've got a question in the chat and this may preempt in something you talk about afterwards is about the question is do students have to obtain a google maps account themselves to um to undertake the work with it yeah they, they, they generate their own google account they can use a, a personal email or their work email when it comes to the academic assessment side of it, what we get them to do is actually share the map. So I've been marking recently. So what I've been able to do is they've given me the link um, or permission to share, then I can go and look at their map and see how it goes on. What I have done, I have done this in the assessment for my final year students. So um, the IT department, bless them, set up 60 Google accounts and um, when they came into the exam the computers were already logged on to a specific google account that we created and in the exam they had a separate file with their um, excel spreadsheets etc which were already on the pc and they in real time in the examination then were logged on to our google account they imported um, the data they tidied up the map put images in etc and once they saved that and logged out we had direct access because it was our actual um, university created Google accounts, but they do need a Google account of, of some sort. Yes. Thank you. And final question. And if you answer this in the next part of your talk, just say, say, <laughs> I'll tell you later. Um, is that because Google accounts require a single user login? Most crime scene activities normally group based. Um, are these activities normally done as groups or individual? It, it depends at what level. Um, they may start out as individuals, then they'll they'll go to um, the group. But you can share with editing rights, um, I believe. So you can have cross or between group contribution in relation um, to what you're doing with with the map itself. So I think it gives you the option when you share it. Do you want to share it so they can view it 
or do you want to share it so they can edit and contribute to it as well? So it does allow group participation. Thank you very much, Tim. And we're now going to pass back to you to resume your talk. Thank you very much. So in this aspect of intelligence and dealing with data, we're going to be looking at generating a timeline. So again, we've got our, our spreadsheet as we looked at before, and it's important here, we've got a date in here and we've got a time in here. So something might happen in times between, we've just got a simple and a, a single time. This is where it becomes important to have this single column with everything in the column um, the same. And again, we've got our groupings by linked incidents here as well. So that will help us decide whether we want a single timeline or a theme line timeline to go by incident type. To import into i2, you have to have this main file shut. But when you're importing, it's a little bit more um, intelligent and it can pick up these individual um, tabs and it gives you the choice of which one you want to import. So if we shut this down and then we go to our i2, what we're gonna do um, here is then import from the file. We're gonna pick our file there, open that up. If you've got the same set of data set that you are always utilizing, you can generate specification profiles and just run those against that data set. So we're going to pick um, a new one. And you can see it starts off with AA alphabetically, but we want our theft from motor vehicle plus Tinsley. So we want that full spreadsheet. Click on that and that brings up that whole tab. So we're happy in relation to that. Up here, we've got our titles, which is the first row of our Excel spreadsheet. That isn't actually part of our data set, so we don't want that um, included. So we're gonna extract column headers from row one. So that puts a line through those to extract them, but still leaves them up top saying, this is what the content of that is. There's a lot of things here you can do, add prefix or suffixes to any of these if you want to unify them, take um, characters out, et cetera, replace values, but we're gonna leave that as it is and keep it simple. Got a range of different options here. We've got a timeline, but we're gonna pick the sequence of events, which is still a timeline in of itself. So that's the one we're picking today. So we've got our option here. This is our hopefully our timeline, our theme line going through here. So we want everything to be on a single one. So this is its controlling entity. So we're gonna say the single grouping, this identity, anything with ZZ is gonna go onto there. So we're gonna set that identity. We don't want it called that, so we're gonna call it something specific, give it a value. So it's our single timeline. And then we go on to our entities. These we want to have every entity for every row. So we're gonna pull our rows across to make it the identity. We don't want to call it um, by the row number. So we might as well call it by our um, location. Our date is gonna be our date. So drag that in, same with time. We want them to be controlling, so they do appear in um, date order. And then we've got a, another description, so we'll have our incident type as our description there. You can, with the cards and attributes, if you want to utilize longitude and latitude, you can import those there, and therefore you could export and plot these all out into Google Earth as an additional functionality if you wanted to as well. So we've got those labeled up there. So we're gonna to go to next. It identifies the date and it checks the format. It's happy with day, day, month, month, and the full year. That's a match, the time. It's identified the time and seen that as hours, minutes, and seconds. So we're happy in relation to that. You can fill in your details for your files you're gonna save here. We've got an ordered layout. We just want the space these entities out a little bit more when they appear in the chart. So rather than just half a centimeter, I'm going to make that um, to three centimeters there. And then we're going to look to import. And this is where you can save that pro forma if you're applying the same analysis to a, a sort of regular data set. So we're not going to bother saving that at the moment. That's importing there. 
So we can see our single timeline there. And here you can see all those entities have been um, imported. What we want to view is the time bar above them. And we can see we've got our days, dates and the times. And the little triangle here shows that there's an entity linked with that time and date underneath it. So if we look at these, the information has been imported where, what it is, date, time, etc. So these are quite good, but they don't help you. Most people won't know what day, you know, the 19th of January was in 2020. So if I select all of those, go to our combined um, properties, and then in our display here, we've got system date and time. So we can look to change that. So what I want is day name long, day month long, year, and 24 hours and minutes. So click OK on that. And now you can see we've got Sunday, the 19th of January, 2020, 0600 hours. And you can maybe more easily see that incidents are occurring more regularly on a Sunday, a Saturday, or whatever, as you're going through. So rather than just seeing the dates, that's a nice, easy way of doing. So that's the timeline imported in there. So if we want to do it by our grouped um, incidents, well, we've got our AAs, BBs, etc. We can do that um, as well. And sometimes that is a, a clearer way of seeing it. So we're still going to import from our, our file. Click our main spreadsheet tab, extract our columns. We'll go to our sequence of events. And this time we want this entity to be our incident grouping where we've got our AAs, BBs, etc. So we're going to bring that into there. This time we'll leave it labeled as that. We're going to go on to our next entity. So we want those all to be um, individual. Label those again by location. Description is going to be the incident, then we're going to put our date and time into there. We're happy with those. We'll just change our layout to space a little bit. So make that three. And as we've got different theme lines, we want to space um, those out as well. So we'll space those out by five centimeters so we can see those a little bit more, more clearly. And you can see now that these have been put on there and they are aligned by AA, BB, CC. And you can see as the sequence of events occurs, A's first, and we get our B's, then we get our C's, D's, and E's going through there. So if we see our, our time bar, again, you can see those linked in. What you can do with these then is look to import your own images into here. You can color code, um, et cetera, um, in relation to that. So if we look at this timeline here and we zoom in, you can see similar to Google Maps. We've dragged images, an actual image of the, the vehicle, location where they were picked up, location where the assault occurred, and then the location where the vehicle was abandoned. The color coding in here, if you want, can match through to the color coding you had for this series in your Google Maps as well. So you're getting that uniformity going through from one to another and it helps you visualize what's occurring and when in relation to all of those. So that's an important part um, of that. The other choice you've got, um, if we go to our um, evidence dump, this here is the um, all the exhibits from this series of incidents. You can see they've got our day, date, time examined, various um, headers up here. If we scroll down, from this, the scenes either attended or they've had a paper feed from, including um, the sexual um, assault referral center and from the post mortem. We've got 
339 exhibits. So they populate this evidence dump with appropriate information, descriptions of what the exhibits are, what the exhibit reference number is, where it was taken from, whom by, etc., and potential uses within the inquiry. So what you can do in relation to that is generate a um, links chart. So if we look at the simple links chart for this series of incidents, we've got our main suspect here at the bottom. This is the evidence that links potentially to them. And this is where it was found in the various scenes, either being locations, vehicles, premises, or some of the individuals actually scenes as well. So you can start building that association up and see where they come. These can be imported directly from the spreadsheet. If you've got a small series to do, it's often easier building it up as, as you go along and importing your actual um, entities. So here, for example, if we wanted to add another person in, we can drag them in. If we want to, then we could add a link between that person and that piece um, of evidence. Um, if we want to bring the car in, we can do the same there and sort of have them as the, the owner of that vehicle. And you can edit the properties and add the appropriate descriptions, dates and times in there by hand if you want to. There's various different um, assets there. Here we've got the common ones, but you can get different ones. So if we go to our crime ones, you can see we've got things there like the assault, the body, car bomb, a burglary at a particular premises. We've got our DNA. This is the one that annoys me, footprint, and it's a footwear mark, um, fingerprint, um, crowbar, etc. So there's a range of different ones. And of course, if you want, what you can actually do is actually put your own specific scene photographs in. So if you've got um, images of a particular piece of um, evidence, or that particular footwear, you can start dropping those um, in as well. So if we look at this, which is another format of um, presenting that evidence, here we've got various scenes, our unknown offender, and you can see we've got different strengths of evidence. The dotted line, unconfirmed linked, we've got some solid ones as well, which are definitive knowledge or information. Footwear marks, fingerprints, drop of blood, the vehicle um, in there. What we can see here is the actual pattern type of the footwear that's being recovered rather than the, the generic um, footwear, um, which is that pattern there. What they've done is actually done a search on the database and found an image of the footwear mark they think is at the scene and added that in there. So you're actually seeing the footwear mark that was, was present. So you can bring that up there. And if we go to the, the timeline, you can sort of see this is the length of a timeline in um, one of the third year um, modules. You can see it's rather large and long. So we've got images of location, map images, information, date, times, etc., going through there in order to help you get that you know, mental picture of what was happening where, what was the significant information, and what came before or after particular things. And here's another one of another third year um, module where they've plotted out all the information, so I won't zoom into that. Other aspects you can do, when we've had um, a series of um, telephone calls, we've got our telephone numbers here and we're showing calls between and the length of those calls. And you can also see here at the bottom, the frequency and there. So, you know, most frequently these calls um, are made on Mondays and Fridays. So again, if you're doing observations, operations, etc., having that understanding of the mobile phone traffic can be important um, as well. Social networks, you can look to build up. So our persons of interest, what links are there between this closeness and degree. So you can look to establish various bits and pieces with that and see who be, might be the most significant individuals in there. Another way of looking at our persons of interest. So here we've got a sort of hierarchical structure, person at the top, 
and then where they link to, who's underneath them, where they've been found and where they've associated themselves with locations, different people. And it just enables you to work through it, give briefings, visualize what's going on, what's going on, what the associations are between people in that. So you've got that there, you can build it. The actual um, software will allow you to do um, various things. So if you want to do um, like a, a peacock, it will automatically change the layout for you. Sometimes it improves it, sometimes um, it doesn't. You can always undo, but anytime you move something, it will mean you have to do another undo. So that will automatically try and do that. If you want to <coughs> minimize cross links, if you've got a complicated um, links chart, it will do that for you. And again, that may be better or worse than you had in the first place. So that's the sort of thing you can actually then do with your data sets and build up a timeline of um, incidents of what's being um, going on, either as a single one or by theme bar timelines. You can put in links charts with various strengths, the evidence types, you can add in images, import the information um, straight away, do it with telephones, and your social networking and persons of interest. So what we're very much doing, as we said at the beginning, is taking um, our data, getting the information from it, um, turning it into intelligence and knowledge so we can actually make use and make value from what we've got. It's not just stuff. Okay, thank you. That was absolutely brilliant again, Tim. Two amazing resources. Um, I'm just seeing if there's any questions in the chat. Um, I really like the idea of the timeline and how students construct that uh, as they go. Can you just give us an insight as to the feedback and the response from students as to what they've thought to your innovative practice? Uh I think it really just helped them picture it because otherwise it's just numbers and when they can actually see the significance and the correlation between something occurring and that timing being significant, um, you know, that helps them sort of generate you know, well established or underpinned hypotheses. Um, and that's an important part as it starts from first year now, it's just part of the general teaching. Um, initially, when we brought this in, it was just to the third years. Then we thought, oh, well, we really should give it to the second years. And then once we've done that, we thought, well, why don't we just bring it in from first year? So we bring it in from the first year. So in the first year module, give them a little um, tutorial on it, expect them to generate a links chart and an intelligence um, module they do in the first year. And there's students from courses from crime scene, forensics and digital, I think. So they show have to have an understanding of links between timings and evidence, digital, physical trace evidence, crime scene aspects. Um, so the, they, they just accept it as part of the, the standard teaching rather than it jumping out at them because it's embedded all the way through the course now. And also, I think it's a great example of interdisciplinary uh, practice, the way that you mentioned all of the different um, disciplines there. And the example that you um, showed us where you have potentially 300 exhibits and you know, with with students having to decide and prioritise, has that brought up some challenges for students as to the decision making process? It has. It really has made them you know, have that thought process. But what they do as part of the assessment, they meant to do a bit of a literature review in relation to the evidence types, um, whether they're looking at some of the, the drug analysis and various bits and pieces, the, the DNA, and, and also the context of just because you find a piece of evidence, its evidential value may vary depending on where you find it. So if you have a fingerprint on the outside of a vehicle parked on a publicly accessible street, it doesn't have the same evidential value as that same fingerprint on the interior rear view mirror when that person doesn't have access to the vehicle. So they've got to be thinking about what line the defence may have to explain something away and thinking, well, yes, we get that person's identity with that, but it's of little value because of where it's been found. So we're going to move that down our priority um, list and um, something where the person shouldn't have access, their DNA shouldn't be present there unless they were the perpetrator. 
So it's trying to build in those thought processes. We can't teach them how to think critically and in that sort of way. But what we try and do is generate the situations and the scenarios to allow them to have those informed intuitive leaps. They've got an underpinning of knowledge and understanding and then they've start to you know, have that thought process. Which is, Wait a minute, if this is happening there at that time, that could mean this. And it's especially when it comes to the family, it's hypothesis driven. Every week I, I get them to do a bit of it or every few weeks a briefing. I want to know what are your current hypotheses? And as you go from um, briefing to briefing, which one of those hypotheses now have been proved or disproved and what new ones have you generated? So they've got to have an understanding of the crime scene students of what can be done forensically so they know the value of the evidence as well as being able to collect it at the scenes. And we try and get them to be able to draw it together. So whether they're consciously aware of what they're doing, we're sort of semi forcing them to, to blend the, the fields from digital to crime scene to forensics. And when we have multiple student pathways on, they're sharing um, that knowledge. So you know, hopefully they do appreciate it. And that's how we try and drive it with the underpinning knowledge with opportunities to implement that. And it, it's where the part of the science is almost creative. You've got to have that imagination to have those intuitive leaps and um, to think, well, this is a hypothesis. We're not saying it's factual yet, but we can then look at what evidence we have which may support or refute it mm -hmm. and work through it like that. I think it's amazing what you've done and the fact you're building up a hierarchy of uh, skills, not just the forensic knowledge, but um, the investigative process as well. And talking about the hypotheses and, and how that drives the decision making process. Um, have you found that this process, the way that you've um, designed these resources, has it minimised bias within your students? I'm just interested because you get them to think about the different steps and I, I think for some it significantly lessens it because they're using the underpin knowledge and they're making very informed decisions but those who are trying to jump too quickly without supporting it if you then get them to look at it they can think well they've gone too far too quickly with that they were trying to force the evidence what often we'll put in is an outlier um scene which has nothing to do with the link series and the good students will look at it, evaluate it and go, well, the timings or the location are completely wrong. I'm going to exclude it because of. And I'll just put a little sentence saying that the other students who don't really um, initially get to grips with it and do the interpretation and analysis side of it, leave it in. And then that's a discussion point. Well, why was that left in? Well, it was given to us as uh, one of the incidents but you're still there to be the human filter to say, does this make sense? Should it be included? And it's actually just an outlier. Chuck it mm -hmm. out, justify why. Um, so that thought process and the understanding of sometimes when you're reporting on something, you don't always know that it's fact at that point in time. It is hypothesis and you're looking for additional things to maybe substantiate that later. But it sometimes takes away some bias who from the students who've had that critical reflection on what they've got and why they're still including it. But I don't think we eliminate it completely. 